were the absolute bee's knees. This was the business. When I was 16, when I was 17, these were already out um, and they were a far off dream. It's that road presence which is the mystery. You just, they look so good. When you see one on the road, they look so good. And when you ride one, they just, they feel like you're riding something special. Kawasaki's reputation was riding on the Z1 being special. The name itself came from Z being the last letter of the alphabet, the most extreme position. And the number was Ichiban, number one, the best in the world. It simply had to be top of the menu. The Japanese team developing the Z1 considered a piece of New York strip loin or sirloin the best thing on the menu in an American restaurant, the absolute number one. And that's why they codenamed the development project of the Z1, New York Steak. Presentation is a big part of the recipe, and the Z1's designer, Nori Masatada, said that his design brief was a 3S styling concept. Slim, sleek, and sexy. You can see that in the distinctive ducktail rear end, which became a Kawasaki hallmark. Then there's that almost organic teardrop-shaped tank. Kawasaki weren't the first to use a single silencer for each cylinder, but the way they did it gives the whole design a sense of purposeful flow. The Z1's design goes to show that even if you're cooking with many of the same ingredients as the others, how it all comes together really matters. This was the era of the so-called UJM, or Universal Japanese Motorcycle. The term first appeared in Cycle Magazine in November 1976, and it referred to how nearly all new Japanese bikes that came out in the 70s were air-cooled, four-cylinder engines with transverse crankshafts, overhead cams, integral five-speed transmissions, horizontally split cases, and four individual carburetors. The Z1's designers realized that how that basic mechanical recipe was styled and presented made all the difference. But, was it all show and no go? What a beast. They weren't short on power, they weren't short on torque. You could stick your girlfriend on the back and you barely notice they're on there you know and that was a revelation for us just to have that amount of power the difference for for most of us uh, back in the day is that we will have invariably got off a two-stroke bike they're fun and they smell great and they sound great and they're good for blasting around but you know on these bikes you could actually go places you could sit on it all day long and they were refined and you could just cover the miles Maybe they were a little bit lacking in the, in the handling and the brake department, but to be honest, we, it's kind of what we were used to. You know, the, the brakes weren't very good on anything back then. You get on these bikes nowadays and, and the brakes feel absolutely appalling and, and the, the frames do actually feel like their reputation suggests is that they're made of rubber, but it's okay, it's, it's not so bad. The Z1 had 903 cc, dual overhead camshafts, 82 horsepower and a top speed of 130 miles an hour, which actually made it the first production bike since the Vincent Black Shadow that could top 125 miles an hour straight out of the box. That was enough to mean that from the Z1's launch, the name Kawasaki would no longer be associated as much with loud, smoky and wild two-stroke triples like the H1 and H2 but now with big, powerful, and refined bikes. The Z1's performance also meant that it was faster than the Honda CB750. And that was important, since both companies were working on a 750cc bike in the late 60s. Only Honda came to the market just a few weeks sooner, meaning that Kawasaki had to go back to the drawing board and start all over again. 
With renewed focus, they dropped the gentleman's agreement that limited displacement to 750 cc and made every effort to make a bigger, better, and faster bike. Imola race winner Paul Smart rode pre-production bikes coast to coast across America for development. These prototypes had big Honda stickers on the side of the tanks as a disguise. Kawasaki even rented Talladega Super Speedway for a whole month where the bikes were run at full throttle until they ran out of fuel and then refilled and run again until empty. All that work meant that the Z1 wasn't just faster than the Honda, it was just as reliable. And a special one-off Z1 tuned by Yoshimura and ridden by Yvonne Duhamel even managed to set a new record of 160 miles an hour for one lap at Daytona in 1972. You know, there were other, there were other big four-cylinder bikes. Of course, there was the CB750. But, you know, the CB750, that did everything pretty well as well. It did everything very well as well. That was another refined, usable, smooth machine. But it, it, just, it, it kind of didn't quite have what this had. This had a bit of sparkle and a bit of magic. And, and it had something which the CB750 didn't have and it never has had. Back in the day, they used to uh, refer to the Kawasaki Z1 as the king, the king of motorcycles. Um, and I tend to agree with them. I think it is. This is the, this is the king of bikes. Mm -hmm.